William Wilson by Edgar Allan Poe Επιμέλεια Γιώργος Πιτροπογιανάκης Let me call myself for the present William Wilson The fair page lying now before me need not be sullied with my real appellation. This has been already too much an object for the scorn, for the horror, for the detestation of my race. To the uttermost regions of the globe have not the indignant winds brooted its unparalleled infamy? O oh, outcast of all outcasts most abandoned! To the earth art thou not for ever dead, to its honours, to its flowers, to its golden aspirations, and a cloud, dense, dismal, and limitless, does it not hang eternally between thy hopes and heaven? I would not, if I could, here or to-day, embody a record of my later years of unspeakable misery and unpardonable crime. This epoch, these later years, took unto themselves a sudden elevation in turpitude, whose origin alone it is my present purpose to assign. Men usually grow base by degrees. From me, in an instant, all virtue drop bodily as a mantle. From comparatively trivial wickedness, I passed with the stride of a giant into more than the enormities of an Ela Gabalus. What chance, what one event brought this evil thing to pass? Bear with me while I relate. Death approaches, and the shadow which foreruns him has thrown a softening influence over my spirit. I long, in passing through the dim valley, for the sympathy—I had nearly said for the pity—of my fellow men. I would fain have them believe that I have been, in some measure, the slave of circumstances beyond human control. I would wish them to seek out for me, in the details I am about to give, some little oasis of fatality amid a wilderness of error. I would have them allow, what they cannot refrain from allowing, that, although temptation may have erstwhile existed as great, Man was never thus, at least, tempted before, certainly never thus fell. And is it therefore that he has never thus suffered? Have I not indeed been living in a dream? And am I not now dying a victim to the horror and the mystery of the wildest of all sublunary visions? I am the descendant of a race whose imaginative and easily excitable temperament has at all times rendered them remarkable. And in my earliest infancy I gave evidence of having fully inherited the family character. As I advanced in years, it was more strongly developed, becoming, for many reasons, a cause of serious disquietude to my friends, and of positive injury to myself. I grew self-willed, addicted to the wildest caprices, and a prey to the most ungovernable passions. Weak-minded, and beset with constitutional infirmities akin to my own, my parents could do little but check the evil propensities which distinguished me. Some feeble and ill-directed efforts resulted in complete failure on their part, and, of course, in total triumph on mine. Thenceforward my voice was a household law, 
and at an age when few children have abandoned their leading strings, I was left to the guidance of my own will, and became, in all but name, the master of my own actions. My earliest recollections of a school life are connected with a large, rambling Elizabethan house in a misty-looking village in England, where were a vast number of gigantic and gnarled trees, and where all the houses were excessively ancient. In truth, it was a dreamlike and spirit-soothing place, that venerable old town. At this moment in fancy, I feel the refreshing chilliness of its deeply shadowed avenues, inhale the fragrance of its thousand shrubberies, and thrill anew with undefinable delight at the deep hollow note of the church bell, breaking each hour with sullen and sudden roar upon the stillness of the dusky atmosphere in which the fretted Gothic steeple lay embedded and asleep. It gives me perhaps as much of pleasure as I can now in any manner experience to dwell upon minute recollections of the school and its concerns. Steeped in misery as I am, misery, alas, only too real, I shall be pardoned for seeking relief, however slight and temporary, in the weakness of a few rambling details. These, moreover, utterly trivial, and even ridiculous in themselves, assume to my fancy adventitious importance as connected with a period and a locality when and where I recognize the first ambiguous munitions of the destiny which afterwards so fully overshadowed me. Let me then remember. The house, I have said, was old and irregular, the grounds were extensive, and a high and solid brick wall, topped with a bed of mortar and broken glass, encompassed the whole. This prison-like rampart formed the limit of our domain. Beyond it we saw but thrice a week, once every Saturday afternoon, when, attended by two ushers, we were permitted to take brief walks in a body, through some of the neighbouring fields, and twice during Sunday, when we were paraded in the same formal manner to the morning and evening service in the one church of the village. Of this church the principal of our school was pastor. With how deep a spirit of wonder and perplexity was I wont to regard him from our remote pew in the gallery, as with step solemn and slow, he ascended the pulpit. This reverend man, with countenance so demurely benign, with robes so glossy and so clerically flowing, with wigs so minutely powdered, so rigid and so vast, could this be he who of late, with sour visage and in snuffy habiliments, administered ferule in hand, the draconian laws of the academy. O oh, gigantic paradox, too utterly monstrous for solution! At an angle of the ponderous wall frowned a more ponderous gate. It was riveted and studded with iron bolts, and surmounted with jagged iron spikes. What impressions of deep awe did it inspire? It was never opened, save for the three periodical egressions and ingressions already mentioned. Then, in every creak of its mighty hinges, we found a plenitude of mystery, a world of matter for solemn remark, or for more solemn meditation. The extensive enclosure was irregular in form, having many capacious recesses. Of these, 
three or four of the largest constituted the playground. It was level and covered with fine, hard gravel. I remember it had no trees, nor benches, nor anything similar within it. Of course, it was in the rear of the house. In front lay a small parterre planted with box and other shrubs. But through this sacred division we passed only upon rare occasions indeed, such as a first advent to school or final departure thence, or perhaps when a parent or friend having called for us, we joyfully took our way home for the Christmas or midsummer holidays. But the house! How quaint an old building was this! To me, how veritably a palace of enchantment! There was really no end to its windings, to its incomprehensible subdivisions. It was difficult at any given time to say with certainty upon which of its two stories one happened to be. From each room to every other, there were sure to be found three or four steps, either in ascent or descent. Then the lateral branches were innumerable, inconceivable, and so returning in upon themselves that our most exact ideas in regard to the whole mansion were not very far different from those with which we pondered upon infinity. During the five years of my residence here, I was never able to ascertain with precision in what remote locality lay the little sleeping apartment assigned to myself and some eighteen or twenty other scholars. The schoolroom was the largest in the house, I could not help thinking, in the world. It was very long, narrow, and dismally low, with pointed Gothic windows and a ceiling of oak. In a remote and terror-inspiring angle was a square enclosure of eight or ten feet, comprising the sanctum, during hours, of our principal, the Reverend Dr. Bransby. It was a solid structure, with massy door, sooner than open which, in the absence of the Domini, we would all have willingly perished by the peine forte dure. In other angles were two other similar boxes, far less reverenced, indeed, but still greatly matters of awe. One of these was the pulpit of the classical usher, one of the English and mathematical. Interspersed about the room, crossing and recrossing in endless irregularity, were innumerable benches and desks, black, ancient and time-worn, piled desperately with much bethumbed books, and so beseamed with initial letters, names at full length, grotesque figures, and other multiplied efforts of the knife, as to have entirely lost what little of original form might have been their portion in days long departed. A huge bucket with water stood at one extremity of the room, and a clock of stupendous dimensions at the other. Encompassed by the massy walls of this venerable academy, I passed, yet not in tedium or disgust, the years of the third lustrum of my life. The teeming brain of childhood requires no external world of incident to occupy or amuse it, and the apparently dismal monotony of a school was replete with more intense excitement than my riper youth has derived from luxury or my full manhood from crime. Yet I must believe that my first mental development had in it much of the uncommon, even much of the outre. Upon mankind at large, the events of very early existence rarely leave in mature age any definite impression. All is grey shadow, a weak and irregular remembrance, 
an indistinct regathering of feeble pleasures and phantasmagoric pains. With me this is not so. In childhood I must have felt with the energy of a man what I now find stamped upon memory in lines as vivid, as deep, and as durable as the exerg of the Carthaginian medals. Yet in fact, in the fact of the world's view, how little there was to remember. The morning's awakening, the nightly summons to bed, the connings, the recitations, the periodical half-holidays and perambulations, the playground with its broils, its pastimes, its intrigues, these, by a mental sorcery long forgotten, were made to involve a wilderness of sensation, a world of rich incident, a universe of varied emotion, of excitement, the most passionate and spirit-stirring. Oh, le bon temps que ceci In truth, the ardour, the enthusiasm, and the imperiousness of my disposition soon rendered me a marked character among my schoolmates, and by slow but natural gradations gave me an ascendancy over all not greatly older than myself, over all with a single exception. This exception was found in the person of a scholar who, although no relation, bore the same Christian and surname as myself, a circumstance, in fact, little remarkable, for, notwithstanding a noble descent, mine was one of those everyday appellations which seem, by prescriptive right, to have been, time out of mind, the common property of the mob. In this narrative I have therefore designated myself as William Wilson, a fictitious title not very dissimilar from the real. My namesake alone, of all those who in school phraseology constituted our set, presumed to compete with me in the studies of class, in the sports and broils of the playground, to refuse implicit belief in my assertions and submission to my will, indeed to interfere with my arbitrary dictation in any respect whatsoever. If there is on earth a supreme and unqualified despotism, it is the despotism of a master mind in boyhood over the less energetic spirits of its companions. Wilson's rebellion was to me a source of the greatest embarrassment, the more so as, in spite of the bravado with which in public I made a point of treating him and his pretensions, I secretly felt that I feared him, and could not help thinking the equality which he maintained so easily with myself a proof of his true superiority since not to overcome cost me a perpetual struggle. Yet this superiority, even this equality, was in truth acknowledged by no one but myself. Our associates, by some unaccountable blindness, seemed not even to suspect it. Indeed, his competition, his resistance, and especially his pertinent and dogged interference with my purposes, were not more pointed than private. He appeared to be destitute alike of the ambition which urged, and of the passionate energy of mind which enabled me to excel. In his rivalry he might have been supposed actuated solely by a whimsical desire to thwart, astonish, or mortify myself, although there were times when I could not help observing, with a feeling made of wonder, abasement, and pique, that he mingled with his injuries, his insults, or his contradictions, 
a certain most inappropriate and assuredly most unwelcome affectionateness of manner. I could only conceive this singular behaviour to arise from a consummate self-conceit, assuming the vulgar airs of patronage and protection. Perhaps it was this latter trait in Wilson's conduct, conjoined with our identity of name, and the mere accident of our having entered the school upon the same day, which set afloat the notion that we were brothers among the senior classes in the academy. These do not usually inquire with much strictness into the affairs of their juniors. I have before said, or should have said, that Wilson was not, in the most remote degree, connected with my family. But assuredly, if we had been brothers, we must have been twins. For after leaving Dr. Bransby's, I casually learned that my namesake was born on the 19th of January, 1813, and this is a somewhat remarkable coincidence, for the day is precisely that of my own nativity. It may seem strange that in spite of the continual anxiety occasioned me by the rivalry of Wilson and his intolerable spirit of contradiction, I could not bring myself to hate him altogether. We had, to be sure, nearly every day a quarrel in which, yielding me publicly the palm of victory, he, in some manner, contrived to make me feel that it was he who had deserved it. Yet a sense of pride on my part, and a veritable dignity on his own, kept us always upon what are called speaking terms. While there were many points of strong congeniality in our tempers, operating to awaken me a sentiment which our position alone, perhaps, prevented from ripening into friendship. It is difficult, indeed, to define or even to describe my real feelings towards him. They formed a motley and heterogeneous admixture. Some petulant animosity, which was not yet hatred, some esteem, more respect, much fear, with a world of uneasy curiosity. To the moralist it will be unnecessary to say, in addition, that Wilson and myself were the most inseparable of companions. It was no doubt the anomalous state of affairs existing between us which turned all my attacks upon him, and there were many, either open or covert, into the channel of banter or practical joke, giving pain, while assuming the aspect of mere fun, rather than into a more serious and determined hostility. But my endeavours on this head were by no means uniformly successful, even when my plans were the most wittily concocted. For my namesake had much about him in character, of that unassuming and quiet austerity, which, while enjoying the poignancy of its own jokes, has no heel of Achilles in itself, and absolutely refuses to be laughed at. I could find, indeed, but one vulnerable point, and that lying in a personal peculiarity, arising perhaps from constitutional disease, would have been spared by any antagonist less at his wit's end than myself. My rival had a weakness in the forcial or guttural organs, which precluded him from raising his voice at any time above a very low whisper. Of this defect I did not fail to take what poor advantage lay in my power. Wilson's retaliations in kind were many, and there was one form of his practical wit that disturbed me beyond measure. How his sagacity first discovered at all that so petty a thing would vex me is a question I never could solve. But having discovered, he habitually practised the annoyance I had always felt aversion to my uncourtly patronymic, and it's very common, if not 
plebeian prinomen. The words were venom in my ears, and when upon the day of my arrival a second William Wilson came also to the academy, I felt angry with him for bearing the name, and doubly disgusted with the name because a stranger bore it, who could be the cause of its twofold repetition, who would be constantly in my presence, and whose concerns, in the ordinary routine of the school business, must inevitably, on account of the detestable coincidence, be often confounded with my own. The feeling of vexation thus engendered grew stronger with every circumstance tending to show resemblance, moral or physical, between my rival and myself. I had not then discovered the remarkable fact that we were of the same age— but I saw that we were of the same height, and I perceived that we were even singularly alike in general contour of person and outline of feature. I was galled, too, by the rumour touching a relationship which had grown current in the upper forms. In a word, nothing could more seriously disturb me, although I scrupulously concealed such disturbance— than any allusion to a similarity of mind, person, or condition existing between us. But in truth, I had no reason to believe that, with the exception of the matter of relationship, and in the case of Wilson himself, this similarity had ever been made a subject of comment, or even observed at all by our schoolfellows that he observed it in all its bearings, and as fixedly as I, was apparent, but that he could discover in such circumstances so fruitful a field of annoyance can only be attributed, as I said before, to his more than ordinary penetration. His cue, which was to perfect an imitation of myself, lay both in words and in actions, and most admirably did he play his part. My dress it was an easy matter to copy. My gait and general manner were, without difficulty, appropriated. In spite of his constitutional defect, even my voice did not escape him. My louder tones were, of course, unattempted, but then the key— it was identical, and his singular whisper, it grew the very echo of my own. How greatly this most exquisite portraiture harassed me, for it could not justly be termed a caricature, I will not now venture to describe. I had but one consolation, in the fact that the imitation apparently was noticed by myself alone, and that I had to endure only the knowing and strangely sarcastic smiles of my namesake himself. Satisfied with having produced in my bosom the intended effect, he seemed to chuckle in secret over the sting he had inflicted, and was characteristically disregardful of the public applause which the success of his witty endeavours might have so easily elicited." that the school, indeed, did not feel his design, perceive its accomplishment, and participate in his sneer, was, for many anxious months, a riddle I could not resolve. Perhaps the gradation of his copy rendered it not so readily perceptible, or, more possibly, I owed my security to the masterly air of the copyist, who, disdaining the letter, which in a painting is all the obtuse can see, gave but the full spirit of his original for my individual contemplation and chagrin. I have already more than once spoken of the disgusting air of patronage which he assumed towards me, and of his frequent officious interference with my will— this interference often took the ungracious character of advice, advice not openly given, but hinted 
or insinuated. I received it with a repugnance which gained strength as I grew in years. Yet at this distant day let me do him the simple justice to acknowledge that I can recall no occasion when the suggestions of my rival were on the side of those errors or follies so usual to his immature age and seeming inexperience, that his moral sense at least, if not his general talents and worldly wisdom, was far keener than my own, and that I might to-day have been a better and thus a happier man, had I less frequently rejected the counsels embodied in those meaning whispers, which I then but too cordially hated and too bitterly despised. As it was, I at length grew restive in the extreme under his distasteful supervision, and daily resented more and more openly what I considered his in tolerable arrogance. I have said that in the first years of our connection as schoolmates, my feelings in regard to him might have been easily ripened into friendship. But in the latter months of my residence at the academy, although the intrusion of his ordinary manner had, beyond doubt, in some measure abated my sentiments in nearly similar proportion, partook very much of positive hatred. Upon one occasion he saw this, I think, and afterwards avoided or made a show. It was about the same period, if I remember aright, that in an altercation of violence with him, in which he was more than usually thrown off his guard, and spoke and acted with an openness of demeanour rather foreign to his nature, I discovered or fancied I discovered, in his accent, his air, and general appearance, a something which first startled and then deeply interested me, by bringing to mind dim visions of my earliest infancy, wild, confused, and thronging memories of a time when memory herself was yet unborn. I cannot better describe the sensation which oppressed me than by saying that I could with difficulty shake off the belief of my having been acquainted with the being who stood before me at some epoch very long ago, some point of the past even infinitely remote. The delusion, however, faded rapidly as it came and I mention it at all, but to define the day of the last conversation I there held with my singular namesake. The huge old house, with its countless subdivisions, had several large chambers communicating with each other, where slept the greater number of the students. There were, however, as must necessarily happen in a building so awkwardly planned, many little nooks or recesses, the odds and ends of the structure, and these the economic ingenuity of Dr. Bransby had also fitted up as dormitories, although, being the merest closets, they were capable of accommodating but a single individual. One of these small apartments was occupied by Wilson. One night, about the close of my fifth year at the school, and immediately after the altercation just mentioned, finding every one wrapped in sleep, I arose from bed, and lamp in hand, stole through a wilderness of narrow passages from my own bedroom to that of my rival. I had long been plotting one of those ill-natured pieces of practical wit at his expense, in which I had hitherto been so uniformly unsuccessful. It was my intention now to put my scheme in operation, and I resolved to make him feel the whole extent of the malice with which I was imbued. Having reached his closet, I noiselessly entered, leaving the lamp with shade over it on the outside. I advanced a step, 
and listened to the sound of his tranquil breathing. Assured of his being asleep, I returned, took the light, and with it again approached the bed. Close curtains were around it, which, in the prosecution of my plan, I slowly and quietly withdrew when the bright rays fell vividly upon the sleeper, and my eyes at the same moment upon his countenance. I looked, and a numbness, an iciness of feeling instantly pervaded my frame. My breast heaved, my knees tottered, my whole spirit became possessed with an objectless yet intolerable horror. Gasping for breath, I lowered the lamp in still nearer proximity to the face. Were these, these the lineaments of William Wilson? I saw indeed that they were his, but I shook as if with a fit of the egg in fancying they were not. What was there about them to confound me in this manner? I gazed while my brain reeled with a multitude of incoherent thoughts. Not thus he appeared, assuredly not thus, in the vivacity of his waking hours. The same name, the same contour of person, the same day of arrival at the academy, and then his dogged and meaningless imitation of my gait my voice, my habits, and my manner. Was it in truth, within the bounds of human possibility, that what I now saw was the result merely of the habitual practice of this sarcastic imitation? Awe-stricken, and with a creeping shudder, I extinguished the lamp, passed silently from the chamber, and left at once the halls of that old academy, never to enter them again. After a lapse of some months spent at home in mere idleness, I found myself a student at Eton. The brief interval had been sufficient to enfeeble my remembrance of the events at Dr. Bransby's, or at least to effect a material change in the nature of the feelings with which I remembered them. The truth, the tragedy of the drama, was no more. I could now find room to doubt the evidence of my senses, and seldom called up the subject at all, but with wonder at the extent of human credulity, and a smile at the vivid force of the imagination which I hereditarily possessed. Neither was this species of scepticism likely to be diminished by the character of the life I led at Eton. The vortex of thoughtless folly into which I there so immediately and so recklessly plunged washed away all but the froth of my past hours, engulfed at once every solid or serious impression, and left to memory only the various levities of a former existence. I do not wish, however, to trace the course of my miserable profligacy here, a profligacy which set at defiance the laws while it eluded the vigilance of the institution. Three years of folly, passed without profit, had but given me rooted habits of vice, and added, in a somewhat unusual degree, to my bodily stature, when after a week of soulless dissipation I invited a small party of the most dissolute students to a secret carousal in my chambers. We met at a late hour of the night, for our debaucheries were to be faithfully protracted until morning. The wine flowed freely, and there were not wanting other and perhaps more dangerous seductions, so that the grey dawn had already faintly appeared in the east, while our delirious extravagance was at its height. Madly flushed with cards and intoxication, 
I was in the act of insisting upon a toast of more than wonted profanity, when my attention was suddenly diverted by the violent, although partial, unclosing of the door of the apartment, and by the eager voice of a servant from without. He said that some person, apparently in great haste, demanded to speak with me in the hall. Wildly excited with wine, the unexpected interruption rather delighted than surprised me. I staggered forward at once, and a few steps brought me to the vestibule of the building. In this low and small room there hung no lamp, and now no light at all was admitted, save that of the exceedingly feeble dawn which made its way through the semicircular window. As I put my foot over the threshold, I became aware of the figure of the youth about my own height, and habited in a white kerzimere morning frock, cut in the novel fashion of the one I myself wore at the moment. This the faint light enabled me to perceive, but the features of his face I could not distinguish. Upon my entering, he strode hurriedly up to me, and seizing me by the arm with a gesture of petulant impatience, whispered the words, "'William Wilson!' in my ear. I grew perfectly sober in an instant. There was that in the manner of the stranger, and the tremulous shake of his uplifted finger, as he held it between my eyes and the light, which filled me with unqualified amazement. But it was not this which had so violently moved me. It was the pregnancy of solemn admonition in the singular, low, hissing utterance. And above all, it was the character, the tone, the key of those few simple and familiar, yet whispered syllables, which came with a thousand thronging memories of bygone days, and struck upon my soul with the shock of a galvanic battery. Ere I could recover the use of my senses, he was gone. Although this event failed not of a vivid effect upon my disordered imagination, yet it was evanescent as vivid. For some weeks, indeed, I busied myself in earnest inquiry, or was wrapped in a cloud of morbid speculation. I did not pretend to disguise from my perception the identity of the singular individual who thus perseveringly interfered with my affairs, and harassed me with his insinuated counsel. But who and what was this Wilson? And whence came he? And what were his purposes? Upon neither of these points could I be satisfied, merely ascertaining in regard to him that a sudden accident in his family had caused his removal from Dr. Bransby's academy on the afternoon of the day in which I myself had eloped. But in a brief period I ceased to think upon the subject, my attention being all absorbed in a contemplated departure for Oxford. Thither I soon went, the uncalculating vanity of my parents furnishing me with an outfit and annual establishment which would enable me to indulge at will in the luxury already so dear to my heart, to buy in profuseness of expenditure, with the haughtiest heirs of the wealthiest earldoms in Great Britain. Excited by such appliance to vice, my constitutional temperament broke forth with redoubled ardour, and I spurned even the common restraints of decency in the mad infatuation of my revels but it were absurd to pause in the detail of my extravagance. Let it suffice that among spendthrifts I out-heroded Herod, and that, 
giving name to a multitude of novel follies, I added no brief appendix to the long catalogue of vices than usual in the most dissolute university of Europe. It could hardly be credited, however, that I had, even here, so utterly fallen from the gentlemanly estate as to seek acquaintance with the vilest arts of the gambler by profession, and having become an adept in his despicable science, to practice it habitually as a means of increasing my already enormous income at the expense of the weak-minded amongst my fellow collegians. Such, nevertheless, was the fact, and the very enormity of this offence against all manly and honourable sentiment proved, beyond doubt, the main, if not the sole reason, of the impunity with which it was committed. Who, indeed, among my most abandoned associates, would not rather have disputed the clearest evidence of his senses than have suspected of such courses the gay, the frank, the generous William Wilson, the noblest and most liberal commoner at Oxford, him whose follies, said his parasites, were but the follies of youth and unbridled fancy, whose errors but inimitable whim, whose darkest vice but a careless and dash. I had now been two years successfully busied in this way, when there came to the university a young parvenu nobleman, Glendinning, rich, said report, as Herodes Atticus, his riches too as easily acquired. I soon found him of weak intellect, and of course marked him as a fitting subject for my skill. I frequently engaged him in play, and contrived, with a gambler's usual art, to let him win considerable sums, the more effectually to entangle him in my snares. At length, my schemes being ripe, I met him, with the full intention that this meeting should be final and decisive, at the chambers of a fellow commoner, Mr. Preston, equally intimate with both, but who, to do him justice, entertained not even a remote suspicion of my design. To give to this a better colouring, I had contrived to have assembled a party of some eight or ten, and was solicitously careful that the introduction of cards should appear accidental, and originate in the proposal of my contemplated dupe himself. To be brief upon a vile topic— None of the low finesse was omitted, so customary upon similar occasions that it is just a matter for wonder how any are still found so besotted as to fall its victim. We had protracted our sitting far into the night, and I had at length effected the manoeuvre of getting Glendinning as my sole antagonist. The game, too, was my favourite, Ecate. The rest of the company, interested in the extent of our play, had abandoned their own cards, and were standing around us as spectators. The parvenu, who had been induced by my artifices in the early part of the evening to drink deeply, now shuffled, dealt, or played with a wild nervousness of manner, for which his intoxication, I thought, might partially, but could not altogether, account. In a very short period he had become my debtor to a large amount, when, having taken a long draught of port, he did precisely what I had been coolly anticipating. He proposed to double our already extravagant stakes." with a well-feigned show of reluctance, and not until after my repeated refusal had seduced him into some angry words, which gave a colour of pique to my compliance, did I finally comply. 
The rest, of course, did but prove how entirely the prey was in my toils. In less than an hour he had quadrupled his debt. For some time his countenance had been losing the florid tinge lent it by the wine. But now, to my astonishment, I perceived that it had grown to a pallor truly fearful. I say, to my astonishment, Glendinning had been represented to my eager inquiries as immeasurably wealthy, and the sums which he had as yet lost, although in themselves vast, could not, I supposed, very seriously annoy, much less so violently affect him. That he was overcome by the wine just swallowed was the idea which most readily presented itself, and rather with a view to the preservation of my own character in the eyes of my associates than from any less interested motive, I was about to insist peremptorily upon a discontinuance of the play, when some expressions at my elbow from among the company, and an ejaculation evincing utter despair on the part of Glendinning, gave me to understand that I had effected his total ruin, under circumstances which, rendering him an object for the pity of all, should have protected him from the ill offices even of a fiend. What now might have been my conduct, it is difficult to say. The pitiable condition of my dupe had thrown an air of embarrassed gloom over all, and for some moments a profound silence was maintained, during which I could not help feeling my cheeks tingle with the many burning glances of scorn or reproach cast upon me by the less abandoned of the party. I will even own that an intolerable weight of anxiety was, for a brief instant, lifted from my bosom by the sudden and extraordinary interruption which ensued. The wide, heavy, folding doors of the apartment were all at once thrown open, to their full extent, with a vigorous and rushing impetuosity that extinguished, as if by magic, every candle in the room. Their light, in dying, enabled us just to perceive that a stranger had entered, about my own height, and closely muffled in a cloak. The darkness, however, was now total, and we could only feel that he was standing in our midst. Before any one of us could recover from the extreme astonishment into which this rudeness had thrown all, we heard the voice of the intruder. "'Gentlemen,' he said in a low, distinct, and never-to-be-forgotten whisper, which thrilled to the very marrow of my bones, "'Gentlemen, I make no apology for this behaviour, because in thus behaving I am but fulfilling a duty. You are beyond doubt uninformed of the true character of the person who has to-night won at Ecate a large sum of money from Lord Glendinning. I will therefore put you upon an experience Expeditious and decisive plan of obtaining this very necessary information. Please to examine, at your leisure, the inner linings of the cuff of his left sleeve, and the several little packages which may be found in the somewhat capacious pockets of his embroidered morning wrapper. While he spoke, so profound was the stillness that one might have heard a pin drop upon the floor. In ceasing, he departed at once, and as abruptly as he had entered. Can I, shall I, describe my sensations? Must I say that I felt all the horrors of the damned? 
Most assuredly I had little time given for reflection. Many hands roughly seized me upon the spot, and the lights were immediately re-procured. A search ensued. In the lining of my sleeve were found all the court cards essential in Ecate, and in the pockets of my wrapper a number of packs, facsimiles of those used at our sittings, with the single exception that mine were of the species called technically Aronde, the honours being slightly convex at the ends, the lower cards slightly convex at the sides. In this disposition, the dupe who cuts, as customary, at the length of the pack, will invariably find that he cuts his antagonist an honour, while the gambler, cutting at the breadth, will, as certainly, cut nothing for his victim which may count in the records of the game. Any burst of indignation upon this discovery would have affected me less than the silent contempt or the sarcastic composure with which it was received. "'Mr. Wilson,' said our host, stooping to remove from beneath his feet an exceedingly luxurious cloak of rare furs. "'Mr. Wilson, this is your property.' The weather was cold, and upon quitting my own room I had thrown a cloak over my dressing wrapper, putting it off upon reaching the scene of play. "'I presume it is supererogatory to seek here,' eyeing the folds of the garment with a bitter smile, "'for any further evidence of your skill. "'Indeed, we have had enough. "'You will see the necessity, I hope, of quitting Oxford, "'at all events of quitting instantly my chambers.' "'Abased, humbled to the dust as I then was, it is probable that I should have resented this galling language by immediate personal violence, had not my whole attention been at the moment arrested by a fact of the most startling character. The cloak which I had worn was of a rare description of fur. How rare, how extravagantly costly, I shall not venture to say— its fashion, too, was of my own fantastic invention, for I was fastidious to an absurd degree of coxcombry in matters of this frivolous nature. When, therefore, Mr. Preston reached me that which he had picked up upon the floor, and near the folding doors of the apartment, it was with an astonishment nearly bordering upon terror that I perceived my own already hanging on my arm, where I had no doubt unwittingly placed it, and that the one presented to me was but its exact counterpart, in every, in even the minutest possible particular. The singular being who had so disastrously exposed me had been muffled, I remembered, in a cloak, and none had been worn at all by any of the members of our party, with the exception of myself. Retaining some presence of mind, I took the one offered me by Preston, placed it unnoticed over my own, left the apartment with a resolute scowl of defiance, and next morning, ere dawn of day, commenced a hurried journey from Oxford to the Continent, in a perfect agony of horror and of shame. Epimelia, Giorgos Petropoyanakis.